So here we go. Welcome, everybody. Um, we are getting ready for the final push of this photo treat team um, training and the last test session. Um, and uh, I want to give an overview of what we're covering tonight. We have Calvin Johnson here from Google, and he's going to give us the big idea. Uh, we're going to talk about the equipment. I think probably most of you are up to date on the equipment, so we will go through that. Um, fairly quickly and make sure you have everything you need. Um, then the advanced preparation uh, and some new tools that we have to show you to help out with that. Um, day of preparation and then also how to submit photos and some new stuff that we have coming out around that and um, tips and tricks that we've learned along the way for making that a painless experience, um, even if you don't have um, a lot of uh, good Wi-Fi where you are. And then finally, we're going to talk about the August 5th testing run and how to get the swag before it's all gone. Actually, before we close the due date. <laughs> so um, without further ado, I just want to introduce Calvin. Calvin, hi. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Calvin Johnson. I'm on the Making and Science team here at Google. Um, and we are uh, sort of handling some of the uh, website and image stitching portions of this, this project. Um, so yeah, I wanted to quickly uh, go over the, the big idea behind the Eclipse Mega Movie. Um, so as many of you know, we are recruiting thousand, uh, a thousand plus photographers uh, who will be spread all along the path of totality. Uh, the goal is to capture as many pictures as possible, as many pictures as possible as the Eclipse passes overhead. Uh, so by, by taking sort of each perspective uh, all along the path of totality, we can stitch these together into a continuous view of the sun's corona as the, uh, the eclipse passes overhead. So rather than the two minutes that we'll get from any one location uh, on Earth, we'll have images of the whole hour and a half that it takes to cross the US. Um, once we have these, um, these images, uh, we'll, so we'll, we'll put out the, the video uh, at the end of the day on Eclipse Day. Uh, that lets us sort of, sort of see what the corona looks like over the course of the hour and a half. And then the entire data set will be available to the general public and scientific community uh, to start uh, getting into the science and uh, seeing what we can learn about our sun from this data set. Excellent. I wanted to mention too that if you run into people after this weekend who want to be a part of the science, um, they will be able to upload photos to the website um, after the eclipse and uh, we encourage them to do so we're just it'll create a bigger data set and um, we'll be able to do better science so I'll get to that a little bit later I believe um, so this is the documentation part this is where you have everything you could possibly need to get ready for the eclipse um, for taking an image of the eclipse or many images the basic photo team setup is for those of you who are just getting started or want a quick rundown of how to do this and what to how to set up. It kind of breaks it down and we'll show you how it breaks it down in just a minute. Um, advanced has some more technical features. So if you're using um, a computer tethered to your camera, if you're um, polar aligning your uh, camera, if you're doing quite, you know, some of the more advanced features um, will be on that second setup, the advanced one. Um, and then new, we just have a checklist for the day of, and we just published this to the group uh, yesterday, I believe. And this checklist is what you should take with you for the day of. It means that you've already done all of the advanced things. You've already gotten your camera equipment together and you know what you're doing. It does give you a checklist of all the camera equipment you might need. But um, the checklist is kind of a rundown to make sure you didn't forget anything the day of. So you're welcome to take that if uh, you have Wi-Fi there, or if you have a way to store a document, you can just do it from your computer or your phone, or you can print out a copy and actually physically check it off. That works as well. Um, so feel free to take a look at that one. Uh, we've got a lot of bit.ly links here, but you can also go to um, the latest update. There's a August 2nd update on the mega movie group, um, the photo test group, and you can find all those links there. Um, that's easier than trying to click on um, a computer that you can't um, actually click on. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're just going to quickly run through this because pretty much we have this in both the basic and the advanced photo team setup. And I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page um, to participate in the mega movie itself. We do need you to have a DLSR or a mirrorless camera. 
check. Um, I think most of you are there with us. And then you will need um, um, a photo, telephoto or a zoom lens. And the size of that kind of depends on what kind of sensor that you have. You can calculate how uh, big of a zoom lens you're going to need at the link there. Again, this is all on the basic photo team setup. Um, and you're gonna need a steady tripod. Uh, that can mean, so when uh, eclipses, when totality comes through, I've heard from many eclipse chasers, it can get quite windy. So not just any tripod, you're going to want to try and keep it steady, maybe use your water bottles or a sandbag or something that you have around to hold down the legs of it. I think you're going to have a much better luck in that case, um, because often the wind will pick up during totality, which is an exciting thing to also experience. Um, and you can either do that, you can either put your camera directly on the tripod or you can piggyback it on a telescope. And um, some of that is in the advanced photo setup, but um, many of you are astrophotographers and are just uh, already going to be shooting that way. So we wanted to include that as well. It's actually gonna help us in the end and Calvin might tell you some about that. <laughs> well, yeah, not a problem. No wind in Wyoming, I hear. I can't wait. <laughs> I will know for sure. Um, okay, so a couple of optional things that you can include. So if you do want to have this completely hands-free, it's really nice to have a computer to tether your equipment, to run a script that will set this all up and basically take your pictures for you so that you can completely sit back and enjoy the eclipse and not have to worry about a thing at all. Um, that is a really nice thing to have. If you don't have that, uh, a remote trigger is actually just nearly as good and you can just sit there and actually take pictures. Some of them you can even do from your phone, just um, click the trigger so that it takes pictures while you're enjoying it. If you remember to breathe and remember to click, <laughs> those are both good things. Um, you will probably want some kind of level. You can um, do that uh, via a bubble level or there are apps there. Or Calvin, can you remind me how you can do that with the Google? With Google as well? Yes, on your phone, if you just search in Google for bubble level, uh, it should open up a bubble level right there in the browser. Excellent. I thought so. It was very exciting. Um, so, uh, yeah, you're going to want to be able to level your tripod when you first start this. Um, it's also going to be August, and many of us will be in hot places, and so you're going to want some way to keep your camera cool. And there have been there's a discussion going on in the Google group about that, um, with lots of different options there. But a white cloth is plenty uh, sufficient to keep most cameras cool for the day in preparation for taking these pictures. And you're going to want a solar filter. You can just put the cover to your camera on, but you would, uh, if you want to take pictures of uh, the partial eclipse, you're going to want a solar filter uh, to take those pictures. So there's more information in the Google groups about most of these things, uh, specifically the software for your computer. There are scripts that we have had members share, which is so incredibly generous of you. Um, it's a really great group who is running this. Um, uh, Solar Eclipse Maestro. Uh, Xavier is a part of this um, group of photographers and Xavier is the one who has freely made this Solar Eclipse Maestro available to everyone. It actually just helps your camera take pictures of the eclipse. Um, he will be on the um, call on Saturday. He will be um, joining us, uh, I think from France at that point. Um, um, on the social evening on Saturday. So you can ask him questions directly. He's been so incredibly helpful and there are many threads about it um, on the group. There's also Eclipse Orchestrator, which a lot of people are using and is also lovely. Um, that runs on Windows and Solar Eclipse Maestro is for Mac. So that's it. Oh, that got bright. Next, we're just going to go through some advanced preparation. Um, you will want to be able to set your time to the second. Um, so the time in your camera, you're going to need to set it to exactly the second. And you can do that. There are many ways to do that. I think time.gov um, is a great one. And um, you're also going to want to determine the eclipse timing. I think I'm going to talk about that after we hear from um, Calvin. Yes, GPS. Uh, so GPS is a cri uh, critical part of how we align all of our images and get them in the right order and everything like that. 
Uh, so we, we need accurate GPS data to make sure that we're um, uh, getting all the images uh, aligned for Megamovie quickly. Uh, so uh, a few things, uh, there's, there's two main ways that you can provide GPS info to us. Uh, GPS in the EXIF tags on your, on your photos are great. Uh, there's a few different ways you can do that. Uh, some high-end cameras have built-in GPSs, which do it automatically. Uh, you can get an external attachment that will do it. Or if you take a photo and have an external GPS unit, uh, you can add the GPS info later in an EXIF editor of some type. Um, or if you want to avoid all of that hassle, if you are taking pictures uh, with a camera without GPS, when you get to the upload stage, just include a single uh, GPS tagged photo from your smartphone, and we'll apply that tag to everything else. So that's detailed in the uh, basic and advanced instructions, if you'd like. Um, but that that's our uh, sort of workaround there. And just a quick update: um, previous uh, previously we had not been able to read GPS tags in RAW, but we now can. So if you are shooting in RAW and have uh, EXIF tags for GPS, we can read those. Whoa. Thanks, Google. And Brian, will you help us with these um, exposure settings and bracketings? Because um, this is about the hardest part of what you're going to do. But once you get set up, it's smooth sailing. This is um, Brian Mendez. Let me just introduce you. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> this is Brian Mendez, who's an astronomer and public education specialist from UC Berkeley. I didn't get to introduce you earlier. Welcome. Thanks, Vivian. Um, so one of the things that uh, we're hoping you might be able to do is take pictures uh, at several different exposure settings. Um, one of the things that your eye is especially good at that cameras can't do is your eye can actually uh, see many different uh, exposure levels all at the same time. And so we can, the human eye actually gets to see an eclipse that's better than most photographs that are taken. So you've probably seen on the internet some of these gorgeous photos like are, are shown in the, in the lower right here. These photos are composites. And so they are um, made of several different exposures all taken uh, at different um, exposure settings, uh, exposing for the different parts of the uh, solar corona. So the sun is very, very, the corona is very, very bright, uh, very close to the sun surface, and then it drops off in brightness fairly rapidly. And uh, if you're able to, what we uh, would like you to do is take pictures of the total eclipse at several different exposure settings. And so one um, way to do that uh, has already been mentioned. If you uh, have the tethered software, the software can uh, uh, has settings to allow you to do this. Or if you're not doing that, you can use a feature that's um, in many uh, cameras now uh, called bracketing. And you may have experienced bracketing through um, a type of photo which are called HDR. So you may have, probably lots of you who have uh, cameras on your cell phone have noticed that this new feature has cropped up called HDR, which means high dynamic range. And what the HDR does is it takes uh, generally three photos at three different uh, exposure settings and then it composites them in the camera right there for you. For your DSLRs, the bracketing will just take the separate photos and then store them um, as, as separate photos. And so usually, unless you've got extra software on the camera, it, it won't do the extra compositing for you. And that's fine, because for this project, we just want the individual photos. And um, if your camera will only allow you to take three bracketed photos, great. But uh, the more, the better. So the, the more you can do, the larger the exposure range you can get. And to figure out what exposure range you want to actually uh, go for, uh, you can use uh, one of two things that are listed in the uh, photo setup um, instructions online. You can either use an online, uh, um, it's basically a form that's, uh, that's um, you just kind of input both your ISO settings on your camera and your aperture settings. That's your f-stop number. And then it will tell you what the different exposure uh, speeds you want to have to expose for different uh, radiuses away from the, um, from the sun. And what we're thinking is that if you can only do, you know, if you can only do one picture at all, then that one picture, we'd like you to get your exposure settings for about one solar radius away from the 
uh, surface of the spine. And so um, if you're using a ISO setting of 100, and, and so you can, sorry, the second way to do this, you can either use the lookup table or the, the lookup form, or there's a link to a table from Mr. Eclipse. And so the table will, will allow you to just look at your ISO setting and then your F number, and then you find the, um, the different exposures for the different radii. So for one solar radii, for example, at um, ISO of 100 and an f-stop of 8, you're looking at a exposure time of a quarter of a second. So that would be your one shot. If you're able to do more shots, then we want you to go above and below that. So if you go to shorter exposure times, that'll get you to see the brighter parts of the uh, inner corona. And if you go to longer exposure times, we'll be able to see the fainter parts of the outer corona. So we're trying to get from everywhere, from right above the uh, solar photosphere all the way out to about um, uh, four solar radii. Or actually, but eight solar radii would be great if you want to go up to a, like a four second exposure. Um, you know, obviously- Some people have that, sometimes some of the um, calculators call that one, the about one solar radius, they call it the middle corona. So that's the other thing you might be looking for. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, other things to just make sure that you uh, are, do test this in advance, right? So make sure you know what your camera is doing and, 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 um, and how this is going to work. Uh, one of the things you can do on a lot of cameras, and I know I'm going to, I've, I've tested this out and going to be doing this, is that you can time how long it takes for your camera to do a bracket. So let's say I'm going to do 12 brackets. Um, time how long that takes, and then I can set my intervalometer, which is uh, something that you might use in your time lapse settings, for example, to start a new sequence um, every, say so in my case, you know, I, I calculated that one sequence of 12 brackets takes right 15 seconds. So I give it a few seconds rest, and every 20 seconds, I'm going to start a new exposure. So inside of two and a half minutes, you know, I'll get several uh, actual bracketed exposures during that time. So that might be a, a, a nice way to be able to just automate it. So all you need to do is click start at the moment of a, a you know, maybe even start it right when the Bailey beads, Bailey's beads occur, and then stand back, you know, hands off. Yeah, you can even start uh, when you take your solar filter off about 20 seconds before you can start taking images then. And if you've had that bracketing, um, especially if you have three or more um, uh, exposure settings, then uh, there's a good chance that it will be able to catch some of those Bailey's beads as well. So that's exciting. Um, and the Make a Movie uh, scientists would love to see those images too. They're not actually for the day of Make a Movie, but we'll talk about when you upload photos what what to upload first so that we make sure we have a great movie and then what to upload later for the science part. Great. Thanks, Brian. Hey, Brian, we have a couple questions that a few people have popped in and, and this sounds like a good time since it relates to what uh, we're talking about here with exposures. Um, and so Gaston asked, can you just please state the desired uh, exposure value without confusion about the myriad of various camera settings possible or is that something that, uh, uh, you know, there isn't a specific one and it has to be you know, different for everyone? So it's a function, it's always going to be a function of three different uh, values. And so um, the, those values will kind of vary, your mileage will always kind of vary from camera to camera. So it depends on ISO, which is basically the sensitivity level of your uh, detector. It's the aperture, which is also known as the F number. So that's the size of the hole that the light's going to get through. And then it's the exposure time, how long the shutter is open, allowing light to land on your, on your detector. So you need to pin down two of those so that you can then vary the exposure time. So you want to pin down your ISO, pin down your F stop. Um, if you want recommendations on that, generally keep your ISO low. So like ISO of 100, 200, that's probably a good idea. And then your F stop, you probably want to hang, you know, it'll, you should test it out with your camera, but you know, for me, I tend to like a, a somewhat larger aperture, um, but not totally all the way open since we're looking at the sun here. So I'm probably like f8 or f11 myself. But it will depend on your camera. You should check. You should test it out. 
And actually, those um, calculators are pretty easy to use. If you put your camera, the type of camera you want in there, it will just tell you exactly what to do. So it's not as hard as um, you don't have to figure all these things out yourself. Yeah. Okay, so Mike asked, uh, he says that he's shooting with a, with a Canon that can do seven exposures. Do you want the seven bracketed exposures, I'm guessing? Do you want the seven images, or do you just want them compiled into an HDR and then uploaded? Um, we definitely want the seven in images individually. That's going to be where we're going to need a lot of the science. Um, uh, that's where the scientists will be able to take that and, and suss out what they need from that information. So the individual images is what we're looking for. Okay, then, uh, then Dan asked, uh, that is, uh, Nikon uh, has the capacity to resolve uh, 12 exposure valves. You, should you expose for the middle range or for the highlights and or for the shadows? So you want to set the middle of your exposures toward the uh, the one solar radius um, exposure setting, and then let the uh, the extremes go for the inner and the outer corona. And I think I've heard them say just do it one stop, each of them one stop. Is that true? Or one step? <laughs> it, yeah, I mean it'll depend on the number of exposures you're doing. If you're doing up to twelve, then you can probably do one. Um, one F stop in between each exposure. Yeah. Great. I can't see the questions. So Brian, you're you let me know if um, we have more questions. Well, we had another one here. Uh, Gaston is uh, mentions that uh, the EV is a single number that can be achieved by balancing ISO shutter and aperture. And I think that uh, is there kind of an optimal number that you're looking for. Um, that kind of takes all of those into account because if you balance all of those out, um, maybe there's kind of an, an optimal number in there someplace. Or do we look at uh, what uh, Xavier has put together on his exposure calculations for uh, on his site? Yeah, I mean, you, I think you would want to yeah go with what Xavier and um, and Fred Espinac have on their sites because they, they've compiled these uh, tables based on years worth of photographing eclipses. So they've got the they've got the experience, and so that's why they put put that together. Yeah, it's not one number; it's a combination of three numbers. So it, and they will vary depending on your camera. So it's best to just look it up once and see which one works for you. And test it out. Yeah, test it. Definitely test it. <laughs> oh. And then uh, one last uh, little question that's related to this, then we'll go ahead and move on here. Uh, so Rick asks, uh, so shooting with the Canon, also doing seven exposures, do you recommend two stops for exposure or do you want one stop? And so two stops would be two under, uh, four under, two under, and, well, two and four each way if you do two stops for exposure. So well, I guess that would be six. And so two, four, and six. Or do you want uh, one for each uh, under, over and under? Um, I've heard the scientists ask for one over and under. Is that what you've heard, Brian? I think that's most likely to get you um, to get you what you know. If you're doing seven, I, I think that'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. One stop either direction because we're really going for that mid Corona is where we're going to find a lot of interesting information, I think. So a little bit over and a little bit under. Just one stop is what they've asked for. Great. OK, so we'll have more time to answer questions at the end, too. So let's um, show you some examples of great photos. Um, these are things we're looking for. They just need to be in focus. Um, really importantly, they're going to need to have between one and four solar widths on all sides. So there's some good questions about this in our Google group. Um, and you can see it just needs to here. These are test pictures that we've taken of the moon that some of you guys have taken of the moon um, and um, They can be little they can be big, but they do need to have at least um, One Sun all around them when you finally end up taking them or if you're taking the test photos um, one uh, lunar diameter all the way around um, and they can have up to four on all the sides. So um, we will take all of the different exposures when we get to that point. So we were talking about this bracketing. Um, we'll take the full set, send them all. That's great. We could use all of them, um, especially for the science part. We'll give you some tricks for uploading 
day of um, in case you don't have great internet um, service at that point. Uh, but for the, for the science part, they do want to know, they want to see all the exposures. They're thinking they'll be able to see um, hopefully some surprises in there that we haven't seen before. Uh, these are example bad ones. Um, the pixelation is a big problem. You can also have them too small. Um, actually, this one's the middle one's just out of focus. Uh, this one on the top right is over overexposed. Um, this is a moon photo, uh, pixelated and um, very overexposed, so you can't even really tell that it's the moon. Um, so just make sure you have fit in focus. Um, high resolution. Uh, anybody who's using a DLSR camera should have high enough resolution um, uh, if we if you set it up to have between one and um, four solar widths all the way around. I will say one thing um, that in two minutes the sun will drift about one solar width. So you want to have it towards the middle. Um, if you only have one solar width on all sides then you're going to want to have a tracking um, camera, some or a tracking tripod <laughs> that allows you to follow the sun. Because if you start off with your sun in the middle and one solar width on all sides, by the time the um, total eclipse is over, it will be all the way over on one side. Um, so you want to account for that. If you don't have a tracking one, it's better to leave a few solar widths on all sides and try and start with it generally in the middle. That will help us out a lot. Um, so that we can actually put, uh, when Google on the back end puts all of these together, we're going to need a little bit of room all the way around um, so that we can get a great movie out of it. Uh, and then when we do the science, we're going to need to see the corona, hopefully on all sides. All right. So Vivian, yeah. here's a question that um, Gaston has. And so, you know, we have this desired, you know, size of the sun within the frame is there. And then you had an example of a low re resolution file there. Is there a desired image size as far as uh, how much resolution there? How many megapixels are we looking at? Is there a desired one? Um. Probably so, and I'll have to get back to you on that, guest. And I'm not positive. Um, Brian, do you know resolution? I know that um, um, let, unless anybody knows off the top of their head, um, we'll have to get back to you on that. Um, so Igor has that online uh, right. calculator that will calculate it for you in terms of megapixels if, if that's the way you like to think of it. In um, The scientists like to think of it in terms of angular resolution per pixel. And so they're looking at a pretty coarse range. I think up to about nine arc seconds per pixel is the, the angular resolution they're looking at. Um, but yeah, Igor's calculator will, will express that in terms of megapixels and, and the size of the image in combination with the uh, zoom factor that you're using. Great. Yeah, thank you. And if that's not already on the, I know it's on the FAQ. So if you go to FAQs, you can find it there. But it should probably also just be on the um, basic setup guide in case it's not a good question. Okay. We had a clarification yeah. on that. Apparently it wasn't uh, image size. It was uh, the field of view. And so uh, oh, I know that we talked about solar radii in there, uh, how many, uh, but apparently let's see, he's asking, uh, so field of view desired two degrees on the tall side, which I'm guessing is the uh, short dimensions of uh, the frame. Yeah, yeah, so the sun and the moon both cover about a half an arc minute, is that right? Yes. Half a degree, yes. Half a degree, sorry. <laughs> and um, so you would want about between, okay, what does that make it? One and a half to four degrees on the short side? That, did I do my math right there? Yes, yes, minimum of one and a half on the short side, yeah. Minimum of one and a half, yeah. Yeah, so there you go. Thanks. All right. Um, so exciting enough, the Mega Movie app is out and will help us determine the um, eclipse timing. Um, we are only looking for pictures of totality, not the partial eclipse for this uh, movie that we're putting together or for the science, really. Um, we're going to want to know. Um, what the corona looks like. We also have some people interested in Bailey's beads, so those happen just the few seconds, well, depending on where you are in the path. It can be just a few seconds before and after totality, so 
Um, the Mega Movie app will give you all those times for wherever you happen to be. Of course, if you've got Eclipse Maestro or any of those other softwares um, on your computer and that's tethered, that will um, be easy to use as well. It can't hurt to write it down because you may not um, have any um, signal wherever you happen to be. So it's good to have get ready for the day, um, having that written down somewhere that you don't lose, you know, <laughs> write it down somewhere you'll find again. <laughs> um, and uh, like it says in the setup guides and in the day of checklist, you're going to want to um, set some alarms for when that's going to happen. So you're ready to go five minutes before and one minute before. It's usually a good uh, rule of thumb. So um, um, those are a really easy way. There are plenty of other apps that will also do similar things, but we know for sure the Mega Movie app does because we made it to do that. <laughs> um, and we'll have some of the makers of that app on the uh, social on Saturday, and uh, so they can answer questions about that for you and what the app does. It actually does quite a bit more than that. So if you haven't downloaded it, it's just called Mega Movie app, and uh, it's great. It's actually been really useful. I've been thrilled that it was so useful in the end. <laughs> All right, so you made it all the way to the path of totality and it is August 21st, the break of day and you've been up all night and you're really excited and you want to um, get ready to take your pictures. Of course, be really, really prepared as far as water, food, gas, and friends go. Um, you're gonna wanna have all of those around you uh, for the total eclipse. Uh, it looks like most places will be selling out of all that. So I know you've all checked your drive to the path of totality, that's also going to be impacted. Um, but make sure to bring everything you need for at least that day and maybe a day on <laughs> the other side of it, because I think that many places will run out. Just um, go in on a full tank. Um, and then we're going to talk for a minute about how to get your equipment ready and what to do during totality. Um, Brian, I'm going to let you take this away. Okay. So one of the things you're going to want to do is uh, kind of get a sense of where the sun is going to be from the site that you're observing. So you can do that uh, fairly straightforwardly with uh, any number of different um, either desktop applications or, or mobile apps. Um, my favorite personal one is Stellarium to use on my on my laptop. Um, it's just so easy to use and and so full of, of features and it's actually got the uh, eclipse timing really down. It's it's pretty accurate. Um, so you can uh, put in your, your uh, the location where you're going to be, put in the time of the eclipse, and check out where the sun is so you get the general idea of, um, of where the sun's going to be. Uh, of course, the other thing you could do is show up a day ahead, and <laughs> check out your site, scope it out, and at the time of the eclipse, look up and see where the sun's going to be. It, it won't be the exact same place, but it'll be pretty close. So at least you have that set. Um, and then when you're uh, preparing to actually uh, point your camera, you're going to want to um, use some kind of solar, solar filter. Um, I, pr I think it's probably easiest to, to use the, the live view on the screen. If you have a regular DSLR, um, it actually, with the solar filter on, it'd be safe to look through the viewfinder if you want. If you have a mirrorless camera, however, you um, the viewfinder may have a separate optic system and it would not be safe. So be careful of that. Make sure you know uh, where the light path is, is moving through if you're gonna actually look through uh, the viewfinder. The live view kind of just takes all of that guesswork out of it for you. So if you just use the, the live view, you should be fine. And then uh, set a timer um, uh, for five minutes so that you get yourself all ready to go. And uh, next slide. And then uh, when you're getting your equipment ready, uh, one of the important things that we need is uh, because uh, for the science, we'll be able to work things out a little differently. But for putting together the actual mega movie on the day of, we need to mo we need to automate a lot of the processing of the images, which means we need to minimize rotation in the image. And so what we're asking people to do is to make sure that they've got the base of their uh, camera nice and level. Um, so we, they talked about this uh, earlier on, you want to use some kind of level. So, so a lot of tripods already come 
with bubble levels built into them, then that, 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 that's useful. So you want to make sure that uh, both the legs and the platform that the camera attaches to are level to the ground. If you don't have the bubble level, you can always try, you know, um, a couple of other things. There's a bubble level uh, in your phone, so you could actually use your phone to uh, attach, you can attach your phone to the uh, tripod and use the bubble level on your phone. If you have, uh, if you have to go super low tech, you could do a plumb bob. You know, attach a heavy weight to a string, tap, you know, tape it to the top of your camera, let it hang, take some pictures. When the when the string is totally vertical, then you achieved level. <laughs> um, some cameras may have a feature that can help you out for that. And then the other thing um, that we want to make, yeah, other thing we might recommend is also something to help you with stability. You're going to have wind. There's probably going to be crowds. I'm going to have kids running around. <laughs> so, uh, you know, stand, I'm going to, I'm going to do sandbags around the tripod legs to, uh, to help for stability. Um, oh, we got just one, uh, go back. Uh, I want to say one more thing there. Sorry. Bev. Uh, the other thing then once you, once you uh, have your tripod leveled, what we want you to do is basically um, pan over in the, what we call in the, what astronomers call, in the azimuth direction, so kind of pan over to the shortest distance between the sun and your horizon, and then you're going to tilt up to find the sun. So in astronomer speak, that's azimuth and altitude. In camera speak, that's pan and tilt. Okay. What you don't want to do is let the camera also rotate on that third ang uh, third axis that uh, a lot of tripods allow it to, because then that'll introduce the rotation and the software will not be able to automatically uh, align the images very easily. Yeah. So I think that answers the question I just saw in the, <laughs> in the chat. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. And then uh, and someone started asking, another thing that we are uh, going to be able to, uh, the software will be able to allow for is if you polar align. So if you're going to do like I'm planning to, where you're going to attach a telescope that's going to be um, tracking the sky in a polar aligned uh, system, you can uh, attach your camera to that same thing, or you can just put your camera on a polar aligned mount too. You don't need the telescope. Um, and then in such a case, you'll always have north is up. Uh, well, you should at least align it. So the north is up in your uh, image, and uh, the software should be able to handle that as well. So either of one of those two ways of uh, we're going to be able to accept images. So either polar aligned in an equatorial mount or using a nice level uh, base for your tripod. So we had a couple of comments, uh, Brian, here in the uh, in the question and answer window. Um, so Tom asked us to kind of reiterate. He uh, believed that he read that with a gem mount, and I'm not sure what a gem mount is, then celestial north equals up, and that's acceptable too, correct? Uh, I'm assuming that the EM in that is uh, equatorial mount. Yeah. Okay. Oh, German equatorial. German equatorial. Mount. No, it's German okay. equatorial. Never mind. Yeah. So yeah. yes, it's. Uh, I was yep, yep. too many acronyms bouncing around here. So yeah, yeah that'll work too. That'll work too. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> and then um, and so then we also have another one just to also confirm. So Jeff says that he doesn't see a checkbox for polar alignment in the upload tool yet, and so yes, you're absolutely correct. You won't see one. Is that still in the works? Um, yes, we. It should be uh, up and available um, by Eclipse Day. And I think we have a sneak preview of that tonight, maybe. If not, you'll get to see it soon. Definitely by Eclipse Day. Uh, there'll be a way to um, check that and a couple of other things, and I think we're going to talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Great. All right. Okay. So there are a few things you're going to want to do in your camera. Um, and these are on all of the checklists and um, setup guides. So day of, you're going to just want to double check and make sure that your shutter speed and bracketing settings are still where you think they are. Make sure you have a um, memory card that has lots of space and that your batteries are fully charged, have backups in case is great. Um, double check your timestamp and location. I know some cameras, um, the timestamp does drift over time. So if you set it a year ago, um, just check that day and make sure it's still true to time. And then your GPS as well. You can check that pretty easily. Um, 
as far as focusing, you're going to want to turn off your autofocus. That's an important one. And focus on the farthest away thing you can get. Um, if you're, <laughs> we've been talking about in the, or I've been listening to the folks in Google group talk about how sad it is that there are no sunspots to focus on um, so that we can actually uh, see how crisp our images are. But if you focus on a dif distant object, uh, it will focus towards infinity and you can turn off your autofocus. Um, one thing to really be aware of is try and disable your flash. You don't want to, um, if you have a flash that pops up, you definitely don't want to tape that down. That can cause your camera to malfunction and not take pictures, which is not what you want. Um, so just, just make sure that the flash is off. That's really important for everybody around you mostly <laughs> because nobody wants to be flashed at when they're watching a total eclipse. Um, yeah, it, when you get ready to do this, make sure that uh, you have the lens covered safely so that you're not um, pointing it at the sun directly for three hours in anticipation of the total, in, in the anticipation of totality. Um, cover it up, like we said earlier. Um, there are a couple of things. If you're only shooting in JPEG, uh, which many of you are, and that's great. That's going to be super useful. There is a setting. You're going to want to set um, the white balance for 5800K uh, or the daylight setting. So if it doesn't happen, it's not the end of the world, but that will help us um, put the images together nicely. Um, in the advanced photo setup, there is some information about taking flat field images, and this will help the science immensely. Um, so if you know how to do that, it's not actually all that hard kind of um, uh, make sure you unfocus your camera and point it at a bit of the sky that's not the sun and take a few of those. Uh, you can upload those with this with your full set um, in the end. Uh, and there's more information about that in the advanced photo team setup. And also on Saturday, if you would like to ask our one of our lead scientists, Laura Petacolis, she will be there to answer questions about how to do that best. And um, so you're welcome to uh, tune in then. That should be pretty fun. Vivian, I've got a, a question that Dee asked a little while ago. And, and so uh, she notes that so with live view, we don't need to use a filter on the camera. Correct, because that's not going directly. Um, yeah, <laughs> Brian, I'll let you ask that, so answer that. Sorry, you probably can say it better than I will. So I would um, interpret that that, uh, yeah. that you know the the filter in a lot of ways is to protect the sensor in the camera, and so I would think that you know it, it's more than just the issue of looking at it with our eyes. That we also want to make sure that we protect the sensor in our cameras, and that's one of the. Uh, purposes of having a filter. Is that correct, Brian? Well, yeah, if you've got the aperture set fairly open, then if you do point your, if you point the camera at the sun, um, when even when it's like half, say half eclipsed or something like that, uh, there's going to be a lot of light entering your camera. And so you don't want to let it do that for very long. So some kind of filter would be useful if you're, if you're um, going to stare at it for any length of time. If it's going to be for a very really short kind of, uh, period of time, should be okay, but um, yeah, it, it's uh, yeah, protecting your eye is kind of the, is is always the first thing you want to do. Protect your eyes, but then protect your equipment too. <laughs> Don't let the camera stare into the very bright sun for a very long uh, period of time. And I just wanted to answer one question from Megana that I saw about. Um, the difference between the second and third picture here. These are Brian's setup, and they're fabulous. But I just wanted to kind of give you. Um, a basic understanding. So the first, um, these aren't videos and we couldn't show that. So what we're showing is uh, stills, but the first one, there's three degrees of rotation. So the first one is like turning your tripod this way, back and forth horizontally. The second one is turning it up and down. You can do that, no problem. Both of those is how you should point your camera at the sun. What you don't want to do is turn your camera like this uh, because then you won't be the bottom of your picture will not be flat with the horizon. So I hope that <laughs> slightly awkward animation helps some. <laughs> Let us know if that's still not clear. So the third one shows the camera tilted in the third degree of rotation, which is not what we wanted, because we want the um, bottom of your picture to be level to the horizon, or if you're mounted on a, um, it, or if you're, uh, you can be polar aligned, which is a little bit different, but people who do that know what to do. Know what to do, right? 
yeah. for uh, for the for the photographers out there, that's the, that's called a Dutch angle. We don't want any Dutch angles. <laughs> I wonder why it's called the Dutch angle. That's funny. <laughs> I've never heard that <laughs> term. Great. <laughs> uh, yeah. So keep it in landscape. Don't rotate it um, <laughs> sideways. Great. All right. Um, okay. And now here's the most important part, really. We are all here to enjoy totality. Um, in the end, it's wonderful if we get tons of pictures. We're excited to get see your pictures. And more importantly, um, we want you to enjoy <laughs> the solar eclipse that's happening. You've probably traveled some distance. Um, I don't want your focus on your camera to take away anything from your experience. So when it happens, um, a few seconds or you know, up to 10, 20, 30 seconds, depending on who uh, gives the recommendation, you take your filter or your lens cap off, you start the image sequence, and then don't look at it. Um, just let it go. If, you're, if you've got a remote trigger, great, go ahead and take pictures that way, but really spend your time enjoying this two minutes that I've heard from everyone it goes by incredibly quickly. Um, I've also heard from many other uh, eclipse chasers who do photography that if it's going to take more than 15 seconds to fix, then don't even bother. Just let it go. This is not the most important part of the eclipse. Your experience of it most definitely is. Um, so I don't want any of this to take away from that. But if you've done all this and you've done all your preparation, there's a very good chance that it's going to work. <laughs> so um, if you've done your preparation and you've tested your equipment out, um, uh, beforehand that's why we encourage you to give it a try test your equipment with the moon this week is a great time to do that uh, anytime before Saturday um, please test your equipment um, and yeah we'll keep it going uh, and talk more about that at the very end um, Here's the exciting part for us on our end is seeing all of your pictures Calvin will you tell us how to submit the photos to the mega movie Yes, absolutely. Um, all right, so you've observed the eclipse, you've celebrated, you've had a drink maybe. Uh, now it is time to continue with the mega movie uh, portion of the project. Um, so as soon as you're able, we know that many people are gonna be sort of out in the field somewhere where they may be a little ways away from uh, Wi-Fi or things like that. Um, as soon as you're able, we hope that you'll uh, get on Wi-Fi and upload your photos at eclipsemega.movie. Uh, you can access the upload portal through your um, profile section. So if you click on your, your face in the upper right corner, um, you'll, uh, you'll get to the upload section. Uh, upload your files. Uh, JPEG is uh, generally smaller than RAW, so if you are in a bandwidth constrained area, uh, feel free to just sort of submit you know, a few of your favorite JPEGs uh, from your, your shooting. Um, and then you know, if you want Later, once you're back home, please give us the, you know, the full set that you've taken because, uh, you know, with, with science, the more data, the better. Uh, so, yeah, once we, uh, once we get your files with the, G with the GPS tags, according to the, the earlier message and the instructions, um, go ahead and submit uh, the photos. Um, we'll generate the first movie uh, sort of a couple hours after the eclipse finishes on the East Coast. So we're, at, we're shooting for sort of four to five uh, Eastern time. Um, we will run the uh, stitching and alignment algorithm um, with as many pictures as we have at that point. Uh, and then sort of over the coming, you know, couple days, weeks, things like that, we will continue to sort of run that and slot in the new photos as more people trickle out of the field and get a chance to upload their photos. Um, so, and uh, one note on uh, credits in the movie, uh, everyone who submits photos, their names will be in the credits of the movie. Uh, we pull those names from the, the profile page, your, your uh, Google enabled account. Uh, so that's, if, if you want to uh, change that, you can do that in your account settings. Um, or we do have an option to submit photos anonymously if you want to keep your name out of the credits for whatever reason. And that's not live yet, but it will be by Eclipse time, the yeah. anonymous submission. Yes. So, Calvin, just to kind of confirm a couple of things. So, Jesse asks, are we supposed to upload JPEGs and not RAW, or uh, are RAWs good? It's all good. We will take it all. Um, if, if you are bandwidth constrained and, and the, the Wi-Fi is really slow out wherever you are, in, in my case, rural Wyoming, um, 
I will be submitting JPEGs only on the day. And then when I get back home to Boston, I'll, I'll submit the, the rest of my sort of raw files when I'm on a faster internet connection. Uh, but we'll take whatever you have. If you are able to upload raws, send them our way. Okay, and then Steven asked that he's uh, planning on doing a Lightroom, Lightroom preset to create the right size quality and quality of JPEGs for low bandwidth. Uh, any suggestion for what will be sufficient? I'm not sure whether that means he's doing any post-processing within Lightroom or not. I know that we don't want any post-processing. Is that correct? Yeah, as little post-processing as possible. Um, ideally, we'll get the full resolution JPEGs from everyone because uh, it, it does make a difference uh, in terms of the, the quality of the, uh, the mega movie. Um, yes, if, if it's too blurry, we'll have to discard it because we can't find the circle in the image. Um, so that's the, that's the sort of the balancing act between sort of getting it out of whatever remote area you're in uh, to us. And Stephen notes that it's just going to be a quick conversion to JPEG um, using an output preset, so no pre or post-processing. Yes, exactly, which is exactly what we'll do if you give us RAWs. Uh, we're, we're not doing a ton of terribly smart things as we convert from RAW to JPEG uh, for this first, you know, algorithmically aligned video. Uh, we'll have, you know, lots of, lots of time in the future to make them prettier using our, our, the different capabilities you can do with RAW. But for now, we'll just be doing some pretty quick conversions. So if the first movie is going to be generated around 5 p.m., what's the latest uh, in Eastern time that uh, the images can be uploaded? For that, for 49 and 49 seconds and 59 seconds. Uh, no, I mean it's uh, <laughs> where there, there are there is some human element to this. Someone someone back here in Mountain View is going to hit the uh, you know compile button. Uh, so it's it's not quite exact, and it'll depend on sort of how we're seeing pictures trickle in, things like that. But we're shooting for around 5 p.m. We'll start the process. So someone on our team is taking one for the team and staying home and is actually going to process these all, no, put it all together quickly. <laughs> um, I, we were going to say try and have them uploaded by about 4 Eastern time. We'll see if that works. But if you can't do that a little later, do it as, late, as early as you possibly can. Yeah, um, and, and I should say we may run some other ones later that night as well yeah. if, if we get sort of more trickling in throughout the day. So, you know, really, if you missed that, window don't worry about it just submit as soon as you can and we'll get to the next batch we're only about five minutes from the top of the hour so let's get through the last couple of slides and then we can answer questions and go over if we need to um oh yeah calvin it's still you <laughs> tell Calvary, us about the science uh, yes, <laughs> science hooray uh, uh so for the mega movie um We've gone over this somewhat, but uh, images that will be included in the mega movie itself, which is the, the movie that will push out sort of algorithmically in the days uh, that day and in the days following the eclipse, um, are from this photo team. So people who've signed up ahead of time, uh, the signups actually close uh, end of this week. So y'all are uh, some of our, uh, you all are our people. Um, so the, the, also the images included are only of totality. Uh, they have to show the full disk of the eclipse, and they have to have GPS and a timestamp. Um, if they don't have those, we'll still keep them, and they'll be used for the, the larger scientific efforts after the uh, sort of, in the sort of uh, more manual uh, processing period beyond the eclipse. Uh, but the ones that algorithmically go right into the, um, right into the mega movie are, are, have to meet these criteria. Great. Excellent. And then updates. Okay. Uh, so we've had a few questions about some of these, and I realize that image is kind of small. It's a screenshot of our, our testing site where we're testing some new features. Uh, but the exciting new features are we can read GPS tags and raw files. Uh, we've got better queuing of uploads. So this was a question earlier. Uh, we had a lot of server timeout issues because we were trying, we were doing some some silly things with with how we uh, queued uh, large files. Uh, so we fixed a lot of that. You'll see a few UI changes. Uh, there's there's now sort of a progress bar for when the the image is uploading and then a sort of spinny thing afterwards, which is us, us talking to the server. Um, and so that's all to cut down on server timeouts. Um, and then there are two new checkboxes uh, in the submit stage, the submit anonymously. So if for whatever reason, you don't want your name included with your photos, you can check that box and uh, submit it that way. Um, or if you are uh, taking pictures with an equatorial mount, there's a little link for advanced options. If you click that, 
there's a checkbox that lets us know that you've used an equatorial mount. Please, please, please make sure to check that uh, so that we know to rotate your images uh, based on your GPS location to align them with the rest. Otherwise, the corona will jump around and do all sorts of funny things as we jump from different images. So, yes. Um, and I should say that uh, while most of these are pretty close to done, we're still hammering on a few of them to, to find any last bugs. So they may not uh, go live before the sort of social this weekend, uh, but they will certainly go live before the eclipse. So, um, Calvin, is there a way to, uh, do you have a method for differentiating darks and flats from the lights when they upload? So I'm guessing that if they do happen to do these, that you want those integrated in with all the rest. Is that correct? Yeah, feel free to give them to us. The way that we check that is we've got, uh, we've got a, a classifier that looks at, is this a picture of totality? Whites, whites and flats, or flats and darks, or whatever they're called, uh, shouldn't look like an image of totality, so we will just add them to the bucket of images for later examination. And they'll be saved with the ones you submit so they know that that's part of the same group. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. All right. Um, and last but absolutely not least, I just want to make sure to get to this. Um, we'll have time for questions after, um, well, after seven o'clock our time. But I just want to make sure that everybody knows in case you have to leave about um, the group testing on this Saturday. So here's the thing. You're welcome to test at any point. Uh, you can test your um, equipment tonight and uh, upload a photo, and we will uh, be checking those. You'll hear from us within a week. Um, if you've uploaded a photo, it's manual on our end, so we have to check at least once a week um, to make sure that to see who is newly uploading photos. So. Forgive us if it takes a minute, but as soon as we do that, we will let you know that your photo has been uploaded and um, tell you that we are sending you swag. And that's what I wanted to show you, just a little bit of, I heard in the beginning before uh, we got started tonight, a lot of people have already gotten their stuff. So um, we have these fancy hats and we've got pins and you get a, um, uh, kind of a surprise package with these and a lot of other treats in them. So uh, definitely some Eclipse glasses to share with your friends, to take with you to the path of totality. Also some, um, some postcards that you can share with people who are taking images in case they want to submit them as part of the larger um, science uh, data set in the end. So uh, make sure to get your testing in, upload your photos. You can do that anytime you want, but we're gonna do this all together on Saturday. There are a bunch of us who have been doing this. Uh, this will be our third um, testing and our second social. So the first couple of times have been about 100 people each night have been testing out photos and uh, joining us. It's a drop in, drop out. You can stop by anytime, but um, we have some really fun guests with us uh, this Saturday, Hugh Hudson, who is one of the, um, brains behind this whole project. Uh, Jay Pasterhoff, oh, and he's not 61. He said to update it. I believe it is 67 solar eclipses and counting. Um, he has seen. And uh, Rick Feinberg from the American Astronomical Society, who has also been leading eclipse um, outings and has seen many, many eclipses in his lifetime. Uh, you might recognize him from Sky and Telescope. He's a former editor there. Uh, we've got Todd Vorenkamp, who's joining us from B&H Photo, who knows everything there is to know about every camera model. Okay, maybe not everyone, I shouldn't. Um, he knows a lot about cameras, so he's a great person to have talk to us. And then Calvin and Dr. Laura Petacolis from UC Berkeley um, and Calvin from Google will be joining us throughout the night. They are part of a, another, an unconference, so they will be joining us in and out that evening. So we'll be able to ask all of these people questions. Um, feel free, last time people um, uh, joined us from outside while they tested their equipment, and uh, it was it's a really fun evening. We'll be having pizza and beer um, here at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, so um, join us. Um, if you go to the uh, group test site, you will see the link there. You can register, um, and uh, registering does not mean you have to spend the whole evening with us, although you're welcome to. Um, you can register and then drop in anytime you like. Okay. Um, yes, and I just saw a quick question. So it is past seven o'clock my time, past my bedtime, <laughs> and I just want to thank you guys one more time. We are actually almost at 1,300 volunteers, which is far beyond what we were shooting for, and I am so thrilled 
Um, it, many people said we would not make it here um, and uh, that we could never train so many people to actually take images and our test images show that you guys know what you're talking about. You're doing a great job. I just want to give you kudos for being part of this project and thank you. Um, the Google uh, group has been such a joy to me. It is really um, fun to get to know everybody and I look forward to seeing your pictures. I want to thank all of our presenters tonight too. Thanks you guys. Um, it's great having you on this project too and um, love hearing all your wisdom. Thank and, you. And Vivian, um you better revise that up. It's more like 1400. Uh, we have uh, officially on the sheet <laughs> that uh, we're coordinating with the Google folks. We have 1,399 on that. And uh, a couple of people just uh, in the last hour or two have applied for the photo team. And so it looks like we're going to be over 1400 here real soon, which means we're closing in on that number. Vivian and I have a little bet. And, uh, you know, I've already lost, you know, at this point, yeah. that number is being exceeded, so. That's great. I, I bet we can I'm make gonna... it to 1,500. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody just asked uh, where we'll be able to see the mega movie video, which is really important. I'm sorry, we forgot to mention that. If you just go to the uh, Eclipse Mega Dot movie site, it will be very visible right there <laughs> on the main site where you've uploaded your photos um, after 5 p.m. Eastern time. That's where you'll be able to find it. And hopefully on every news station you turn on. <laughs> um, so thanks, everybody. If you'd like, we can stay and answer some questions. But um, yeah, we have a few yeah. that, that I would like to be able to get out there. And some people have had some um, questions that they'd like to. And I think that they would be worth you know, answering. Yeah. So and if you have some that we you haven't put on there yet, go ahead and put them in the Q&A um, and not the chat, just so we can keep track of them. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I can't see them, so somebody else is going to. Okay, well, I'll start. So, so, so Ben has a really uh, good question, and and I think he, he, I think he's the one who asked it at the very beginning, and uh, we've had so many other questions come in that we kind of lost track of it. So we apologize, Ben. So Ben basically asks, if we upload the test and it's not correct for some reason, are we going to notify them, and so that they can kind of fix what they're doing? Calvin, I'm letting you take that one. Uh, yes, yeah, so we we are are working on sort of clicking through all of the uh, submitted test images. Um, we will try and get back to everyone quickly. Uh, our, so far, what's um, what's been easiest is sort of keeping an eye out for general trends of issues that we see, um, rather than providing individual feedback to everyone. Um, and so it's it's on our to do list, but we've we've got a few different things that we're we're chasing down all at once. Yeah, that part's pretty manual on our end. So um, you probably won't get a note saying this one didn't qualify. Um, if you upload it and it goes through the system and it identifies it as a moon or a sun, then we're going to call that good. And that's pretty much the best we got. As long as you can, as long as it fits those qualifications we've had there, try and get it as in focus as possible. That's going to really help the movie a lot and definitely the science. And that kind of relates in. So we have a um, we had a question that come in that says, "What's expected as test photos?" I know that that's been um, bounced around a little bit. Maybe just really quickly. I know you mentioned that uh, in focus is uh, kind of a requirement, but uh, and then we talked about the uh, field of view and how many, you know how large the uh, the moon is in the test photo. So just really quickly, what are the requirements? Oh, yeah, so it needs to be in focus. It needs to be high enough resolution, so you can't um, zoom in on a digital camera and um, and take a very wild, wide field image and then just send us a zoomed in version because you're going to need high resolution. Um, uh, it needs to have between one and four solar widths on either on all sides. So those are pretty much the requirements. Um, I, one thing I forgot to mention, and it's on the group, but I wanted to talk about this really quickly. The last day for uploading test photos, if you want the swag, which you can get, you can upload test photos at any point along the way. Um, but uh, we're all going to the path totality, so pretty soon here, it's going to be a ghost town. And uh, we want to make sure to get the swag to you before you also go. The last day to upload those is Sunday, August 6th. On the next morning, we're going to pull all of those um, photos and all the names uh, that go with it, all the emails 
um, and send you an email that says, congratulations, you uploaded a photo, there is swag on the way, and then we'll be sending that off early next week. Um, so August 6th is the last day to upload test photos. You will be able to upload them and test out the system after that, you just won't get the swag. It's also the last day to add new members of the Mega Movie. So if you have any friends who wanna join, now is the time, because after August 6th, we will not be adding any more new members, although you will be able to submit photos um, after the eclipse, um, and those will go into the larger data science set. Okay, after the yes, not yeah. but after six, we're going to turn after the six, we're going to turn it off until eclipse day. So. Yeah, exactly. So, so here's a, a question that it kind of comes up with, with this uh, a fair amount, and so somebody wants to upload test photos and they're not finding the upload function. And so this is a, a common thing that a lot of people have encountered. So what can they do if they don't have the button for the upload function? Well, I have been on the phone today with many people <laughs> trying to work this out individually. Um, one thing to note is it does take about a week for the upload function for your, um, uh, for your profile to be cleared and the upload function to appear. If after a week um, of being in the Mega Movie group you don't see that, um, you can send us an email. Uh, what is most likely is you're using different emails for the group and trying to log in. Uh, an easy way to test that is to log out of the Eclipse Mega movie site and log back in using whatever email you used <laughs> to um, uh, that you're using on the Google group. Uh, if you're using the same on both of those, it should work um, nine times, 99 times out of 100 at this point. <laughs> We've had enough testing on this one. Um, uh, if you look in the most recent update, there's information about that too that kind of goes over that in a written form so you can check back. Okay, so here was an um, interesting question. So William says, how is the software gonna deal with various color images caused by different filters. So I'm guessing that uh, we're thinking about, you know, we're looking for unfiltered images of totality, correct? Right, yep, exactly. And if, if people are using other filters that adjust the, the color slightly, um, the image will sort of reflect that. We're not doing too much color balancing on this first run, but for future, uh, future sort of more manual ones, we can, we can do that. Okay. And um, uh, information about the August 5th social is where? We sent out, I, I seem to remember seeing an email that sent out or a posting in the photo team group. Yep, if you go to the photo team, it's right there in the welcome message on the top. It's also in the latest update that should be at the top of, I think we've pinned it to the top of the list of questions there. I know there are a lot of questions going on. If you're not following all of them, you absolutely don't need to. Um, there's a lot of fun information in there, but also if you just stick with the updates at the very top, that'll do just fine too. You can still participate. Okay, so here was a question that, that came up. And so um, recognizing that we're making provision for other file types, um, what if they contain some other non-photo type data? So if there's some notes or some other things that are attached, uh, script files where they're taken. And so is there any limitation about the uh, EXIF data that's uh, attached to some of the images? Or does that become a problem? That's a very good question. I don't think it should be a problem. Uh, we edit some fields during upload. Uh, like if, if you upload a, if you're doing the upload a smartphone photo with the rest, uh, of the non GPS tagged ones, we'll, we'll edit the GPS tag uh, in EXIF, but I don't think there should be any problems with, with any of those things. But I can confirm with our range folks. And D, I just saw that you said, is there any possibility of getting the a hard copy, uh, a copy of the postcard artwork for printing? And I will absolutely um, post that in the Mega Movie um, photo team group. A great one that was by Tyler Nordgren really fun he's made a lot of posters for the eclipse so here is a question from a, a while ago Aaron said uh, so if somebody's gonna planning on switching to a different camera that's uh, in comparison to the camera that they originally said that they were going to use 
Um, do we really want them to update that information or is that kind of a minimal thing? Is it, is it really essential that we know that they upgrade to something better than what they said they're going to use? No, you don't have to let us know that as long as it still meets the requirements, we believe you. Yeah. Yep. And congratulations. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. So yeah. <laughs> I think an awful lot of people have uh, used this as a good excuse to uh, upgrade their, their equipment. <laughs> and you know, that inter the information on the camera is often stored in the uh, tags and in the, in the images as well. Also, uh, Michael clarified his question um, saying that you know, if he's he's talking about uh, uploading files that are not photos, uh, no, we don't we don't handle those. Uh, we we are limited to uh, JPEGs and RAW files mostly, and TIFF and maybe PNG. Uh, but yeah, just image files. Uh, so uh, we can't accept we can't take your text files or or other things. Okay. <laughs> So let's see, um, Spencer says that uh, uh, he's going to be running the script. Um, see if I can understand this. He's going to run the script that he's going to use on Eclipse Day for his test on Saturday. Half of those are going to be overexposed because of the shutter speeds. Is that OK? We will take them because they may expose different parts of the corona that we're looking for, from what I understand. Stop me if I'm wrong. Dr. Brian. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the same. Uh, th yeah, that'll happen anyway. If you're running a, a script that's going to, you know, expose um, for, you know, the outer corona, and you're doing a test on the sun or on the moon, then you're going to way overexpose the, the actual sun or, or the moon. So, yeah, that, that's that's going to happen. So you're doing that test basically just to make sure your camera's kind of doing what you expect it to do. Um, you know, you could upload it, I suppose, just to test whether, you know, to test, I guess, your uploadability, but you know, personally, I, I just kind of left the unexposed, overexposed ones out when I was testing upload. Because you're more just kind of testing your where do I go, how do I get my images up, and do the good ones look good? Mm -hmm. But do you want those for the science? Does anyone want those along the way at you know after the movie's been made? Well, or no, because during during the actual fatality, they won't be overexposed. So oh, okay. Just during the test, they're going to be overexposed. Got it. Because the sun is so much brighter than the actual corona. Got it. <clears throat> or the the moon in this case, potentially. Right, right. Right. If you test in the moon, that makes sense. So George asks a really good question, and so a lot of uh, I know I know I do this too. Uh, I have copyright information automatically attached to each image in camera, and so he says, should copyright information be removed from the EXIF data, or is there a copyright field you would like us to use, or is that going to be dealt with uh, separately in the license that they kind of check off on? Yeah, so that that one's handled separately in the license that you check off. Um, the all all images submitted to the project are released under uh, CC zero public domain license. There's a link and a checkbox right as they're the first stage in in uploading, so you can't even get to the upload portal without um, getting through that point. Uh, so yeah, we'll. Um, I don't think we'll replace. I'm not sure if we'll, we'll we'll replace that field or not, but we will we will tag everything as CC zero public domain. Because I know a lot of photographers will be using their photos for other purposes, and they'll be uploading from yeah, here, so but they're using it. So uh, yeah, so, so uh, sorry, I just got a warning that my inter internet connection is unstable. Hopefully, we can hear me. Um, so yeah, I know, I know a lot of people have their own uh, sort of systems that they use for this. Uh, for this project, just to make sure that the scientific community can use the photos without too many different licenses all at once and everything like that. We just decided on having everything uh, CC0 public domain. Uh, so that just means that um, people that use the, this data set and these images in the future can edit the photos, can you know, uh, combine them into you know, HDR photos and things like that um, without violating the terms of the, uh, the license. Um, but they could go ahead and leave their copyright data on for their own purposes. They don't have to strip that out or eliminate that. Or would you would it make it easier if they didn't even have that embedded in their own files? No, I think I think you can leave it in there. That's fine. Okay. 
So uh, Stephen has uh, a question here about uh, flats. And so the mega movie documentation states that the imaging system should be defocused uh, from what he can tell uh, from other reading and others on the message board, uh, the imaging system should remain in focus. And so, uh, you know, flats, defocusing focused images is there, you know, I'm not familiar with doing those, but uh, I, uh, Brian, I think you are. Yeah, well, I haven't done them with the camera <laughs> and the lens. I've done them with, you know, a four meter telescope. <laughs> um, and I, uh, when we do dome flats where they're not focused, but when we do sky flats, I guess we also don't really worry so much about focus in the sky flats. Um, I don't know. I would have to talk to to some others on the science team who are actually going to be processing these data as to what they're thinking is there. Um, you know, the general idea of a flat is that you want a consistent light source that illuminates the entire chip. And what that does is then it reveals the uh, pixel to pixel uh, sensitivity differences. Um, and focused or unfocused should basically get that. I think I was seeing someone being concerned that if there's uh, things like dust flecks on the lens or anything like that, then unfocusing them may give you a different flat than what you're really going to have in the science images. And I, I, I buy that argument. So. I don't know. I think I think to definitively answer this, we should probably talk to someone uh, who's actually going to be doing the science uh, reductions and make sure we follow their recommendations. Um, I'm going to check in with some of the scientists um, before Friday, and we will post that answer on the Google group um, under flaps. It, the title will have flats in it, so keep an eye out. Um, a definitive answer on flats. Um, something along those lines. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Also, folks, I'm afraid I need to run. But... Me too, you guys. I got a kid to get home to. It was so nice um, talking with you all tonight. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see all of you hopefully on Saturday. Yeah, we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Good night. Clear Good night. Skies, no clouds. <laughs>